When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Proverbs 29. Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Darlene Miller of the Tabo Mbeki African School of Public and International Affairs. I'm your program director for tonight, and we welcome you here heartily. The title of our Africa topic tonight is The African Union at 20. We have called our great African lions to speak with us. We have called our great lionesses to herd us when we stray, hear these wise visionaries, and heed their truths. Our Twitter handles for our social media crowd, at UNISA, at TM Foundation, at Lenkabula, and at UNISA Africa Today, at hashtag UNISA Africa Today. I now will hand you over to our very special, very dear Professor Puleng Lenkabula. She's the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of UNISA. And guess what? The first woman Vice-Chancellor in 148 years at UNISA. Isn't that wonderful? She's also a prof Professor of Ethics supervising the intersections of ecology, economy, and feminist theorization. She is wholly, fully, with all her heart committed to the success of UNISA, to making our university a proud and innovative African university for global thought leaders. I ask you now, for the purpose of our protocols, our Vice-Chancellor will come up and conduct the protocols and further introductions. Welcome, Professor Puleng Lenkabula. Good evening. Dumelang. San Bonan. Good evening. Thank you. I, I'd like to acknowledge the Director of Programs, Professor Darlene Miller, who is an Associate Professor of Citizenship Studies at Tabo Mbeki African School of Public and International Relations, who will be steering our program this evening. I also want to acknowledge His Excellency, the former President of the Republic of South Africa, the patron of Tabo Mbeki Foundation, and the Chancellor of the University of South Africa. Good evening, President. Thank you. Dr. Geraldine Fraser Mulegeti, the Chairperson of Tabo Mbeki Foundation Board, but also the Chancellor of the University, Nelson Mandela University. Our keynote this evening, a doyen of knowledge, a tower and fountain, who's looking at the formation, formation of African scholars and their global contribution in shaping futures. Professor Toin Falola, Professor of History, University Distinguished Teaching Professor, the Jacob and Francis Sanger, Mosica Chair in the Humanities at the University of Texas, Austin. Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, and High Commissioners representing various countries and international organizations present in person but virtually, UNISA Council members present or those who are participating virtually, Professors Ville Ngomo, 
Executive Dean of Tabo Mbeki African School of Public and International Affairs, Professor Edith Paswana, who's also the director at the Tabo African uh, School of Public and International Affairs, Mr. Ronald Lamola, Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Ms. Stella Ndabeni Abrahams, Minister of Small Businesses Development, Dr. Regina Klaule, Deputy Minister of Basic Education, Mr. Jeffrey, John Jeffrey, Deputy Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Mr. T. Kalipa, Executive Mayor of Machabeng Local Municipality, Advocate Koleka Kaleka, Deputy Public Protector, and we recognize the former Speaker of the Parliament of South Africa, Mr. Max Sisulu, and Ms. Eleanor Sisulu present, members of the Advisory Council of the Tabombeki Foundation and former principals and vice chancellors of the universities of South Africa, members of UNISA management present, members of UNISA board of trustees present, the student representative councils and students who are the reason for existence of universities, and thus uh, we would like to acknowledge them. Ladies and gent gentlemen, all protocol uh, <laughs> observed. I want to state that uh, this is quite a, 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 a long protocol, but I am advised that uh, universities must always ensure that uh, we are obliged to these pro protocols. I want to start by really acknowledging with great pleasure and welcome you to the historic, historic and important occasion where we are celebrating this continent, the august continent of Africa, in marking the 20 years of the African Union, the 12 years that the Tabo Mbeki School has been initiating Africa Day lectures, but also the historic moment that the University of South Africa would be celebrating, which is 149 years today, and yet uh, next year, 150 years. These are important aspects for UNISA, is the inventor of open distance e-learning in the world, not just here at home. And that's what we have bequeathed the world with, which is becoming even more relevant in the aftermath of COVID-19, where digitalization and distance education has become an important imperative, if not an asset, for the world. We stand highly indebted to President Thabo Mbeki and the School of Public International Affairs for notable efforts in keeping the Pan-African dream of our forebears alive amidst the constant barrage and mammoth of challenges, but also to igniting that sense of hope where knowledge and research find praxis in the solution systems that we in society and in universities must be at the center of. At UNISA, we twin the deliberate emphatic points of Africa and international because we understand the role of Africa in the global arena cannot be nominalized as has been the case in the past. We recognize the deliberative effort of African epistemological systems at the core of international discourses, not only for the sake of Africa's knowledge to being evidence, but for the idea of humanizing a world that at many times has forgotten what it means to respecting humanity and humanity in all its diversities. For far too long, the voice of global forums has often been muted and undermined in international world order that exhibits traits of racism, sexism, militarism, as well as money marginalizations of forms of exclusions and knowledge that Africa would have done. And the invitation by President Becky for us to thinking through what it means ontologically, but also in terms of knowledge to being African and his invitation in 2002 
to rethinking and reimagining the African, the organization of African Union into the African Union is an important, important invitation that all of us in society, including as institutions of higher learning, must affirm. The strategic repositioning and erudite reconfiguration of the OAU with the baggage that it had had, but with the responsibilities to ensuring that the future of Africa is ascertained is very important. For the past 12 years, the Tabombeki School has been growing in leaps and bounds within the University of South Africa, but also in the global arena, because that's where we play. Increasingly becoming an academic center of excellence for the country, for the continent, but also for the world, it has become a flagship arena for the University of South Africa, but also for South Africa in general. The challenges and opportunities of the continent are not what I will delve deep into because that is the question that our keynote speaker and in conversation with all of us will be raising. But allow me to cite our keynote speaker's quote. In his book, African Universities Shape, in his book on decolonizing African studies, knowledge production, agency, as, and voice. This is an invitation to ensure that knowledge is not just uh, talked about, it's embodied, it transforms, and the agency of those who know uh, are able to be co-constructing and building its futures. And he says, allow me to quote you extensively, uh, Professor Falola. He says the future, with respect to the status of coloniality, appears to be a joint venture between intellectuals, the government, and the people of the nation. Both Sameh Amin and Fanon recognize the complexities faced in the task of decoloniality and decolonization, just as another critique. Achima Feja from South Africa focus was also concerned with the maintenance of the state infrastructure. Mafeje places emphasis on the variety of roles of intellectuals in society. His taxonomy includes the intellectual who is able to rebel against the status quo. So rebellion is never a destructive act. It can be harnessed for progressive transformations. But he also said, Mafeje also reminded us around those transcended intellectuals who are opposed to the current uh, state, as well as those intellectuals who do not, uh, who do not appreciate the intellectual freedom sets, uh, uh, which has to set them apart from many academics, researchers, and theorists, and his argument to placing a heavy emphasis on the necessity of political and economic action, which is long overdue for the revolution if future generations are to prosper, must always be attentive to this. And thank you, Professor Falola. Therefore, colleagues, I would like to ensure that uh, those of you who are able to read the text, uh, we wish to welcome you to this important lecture, the Africa lecture that the University of South Africa the Tabombeki School of Governance, uh, as well as the Tabombeki Foundation has organized, and we celebrate with the vision expressed in 1963, refined in 2002, and today that we are celebrating around the envisaged utopia, but also the envisaged transformations that we must be ourselves embedded in. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Linkabula. Can we all please stand for the national anthem? Africa, my 
Thank you. What a beautiful anthem. Um, and now I would like to hand over to our gentle but firm leader, the Executive Dean of the Tabo Mbeki African School of Public and International Affairs, Professor Sibu Siso, Villan Como. Prof. Como has his own stellar background. He is one of those cum laude professors. We, we have to tell the people, Prof. <laughs> it's not just anybody that was brought to the school, you know. <laughs> um, he's a research, he was a research professor in the Center for Advancement of Scholarship at the University of Pretoria. And one of the things I like on his CV is that he serves on the editorial board of the Servant Leadership Journal, published at Gonzaga University. Welcome, Prof. <laughs> Thank, you 
Thank you very much, Madam uh, Chairperson of this august occasion and great celebration. I want to say there comes a time in the history of a people where you ask yourselves, why do we have universities? Why do universities exist? Do they serve the purpose of a country, a continent, and the world? We have certainly come to try and want to answer that deep question. We deliberately sought to name our school the Tabombeki African School of Public and International Affairs. We named it after a great son of South Africa, a great son of Africa, and a player in the world. An intellectual, a deep thinker, an economist, a diplomat, and a student of history. We were afraid that if this great son of Africa is gone unforgotten, all of the qualities which I've mentioned will also disappear. So the school has been spoken a lot about and we have learned from him that transdisciplinarity is the way to go. Transdisciplinarity allows for a university to be able to groom and educate young people who can have a broad perspective to knowledge and a broad understanding of how developments must take place. So I'm uh, highly delighted that the name Tabombeki has given us that opportunity to explore transdisciplinarity with our masters and PhD programs. We are convinced that without curriculum reform, you cannot go anywhere. You cannot continue with a curriculum which is colonially based only, but you must also expose your own thinking as an emerging country, as an emerging continent, and as a continent which is freeing itself from bondage or past history. But it doesn't mean that you negate what the rest of the world is also there to offer. You've got to also take that into consideration. Tabumbeki African School of Public and International Affairs, which I'm going to refer to as the TM School, also pays attention to being a center of excellence. I want to cite Nyara Sudakasa, the late Nyara Sudakasa, who used to say, excellence must be the buzzword of an institution of higher learning. Because if you don't, a spouse, excellence, you are actually going to produce mediocre students and non-competitive students. Our school is also committed to the reconstructing, to reconstructing and the deconstructing of the study of public and international affairs. We've heard a lot about public administration, we've heard a lot about separate disciplines all over the place. But we are saying we want to bring together public and international affairs because they go together and they make a difference and it makes sense why in other parts of the world they've established schools like the John F. Kennedy School of Government, they've established the um, Lyndon Johnson School of Public Affairs and it makes sense that we should actually be competitive and also come up with a combination which is unique to this part of the world. I want to summarize by saying we are lucky as the TM school to have outstanding individuals associated with us 
and one of them is going to be the keynote speaker tonight, uh, Professor Toyini Falola, who has distinguished himself as a professor. Professor Fumni Olonishikin, Dan Rich, Deborah Sanders, Mashu Pemase Remole, and also we have, we have the opportunity of hearing officials, former officials, former ambassadors, and former members of multilateral entities making a contribution to our thinking processes as we create this school, which we say it shall not be second to none. Finally, I must share with you that we have had the luck of attracting some of the best minds so far, some of the best minds so far in the academic world. Hopefully in a few days, we will release a newsletter on them and the names of our distinguished board of advisors chaired or led by Professor Falola. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Prof. We have a little AV sound bite for you. Wow. <laughs> so those were our 12 talks that we've had at UNISA. Um, the inaugural um, Africa Day lecture was given by our very own esteemed patron and chancellor, Thabo Mbeki, who was instrumental in the formation of the African uni Union. He gave us the ideological fuel for this vision in the program of the African Renaissance. And tonight, it is time for us to reflect. So we call on Tabo Mbeki to introduce this phenomenal human being we have here for you today to help us with this reflection. <laughs> Welcome, Tata. Do we need this thing? Yes, we do. I don't think we do. This no, one is working. Okay. It's okay, leave it. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Program Director. Um, I suppose all of us have seen this program. Uh, and as, as, if you've read it, you will see that it says, uh, I must speak for 30 minutes. Now, I decided no, that that was not enough. So I'll speak for 40. Um, but thanks a lot, Program Director. Um, I'm, I'm very, very glad indeed that uh, we have Professor Falola as our lecturer this, this year. I will say something about him just now. Um, 
When we asked the African Union for permission to host, we asked uh, the African Union for permission to host what was then the Organization of African Unity. And we said we would like to host the summit of the OAU in the year 2002. Normally, you ask for that permission two, three years ahead of time. Yeah. And the OAU agreed. The reason for it was that it was the 90th anniversary of the ANC. So we thought it would be important that on that anniversary, the continent it should join us here in South Africa to celebrate that particular birthday. It really to reaffirm uh, the very nature of the African National Congress as a pan-African organization. And so it happened that uh, during the, as we waited uh, for the OAU to come to South Africa, it changed into the African Union. And that's how we became the host. And of course that generated high expectations, the formation of the African Union. Because it uh, did seem at the time that with the liberation of South Africa in 1994, at last the summit, the, the, organization, the, the organization of African Unity, which became the AU, would attend to this other particular matter yeah, of the reconstruction of our continent. Because indeed, ever since the OAU had been formed in 1963, its real binding matter was the, the struggle for the liberation of our continent. And I'm saying that with the liberation of South Africa, it looked like uh, the time had come that the OAU, which became the AU, must attend to this matter of the eradication of poverty, eradication of underdevelopment, development of our continent, replacing it in the context of the rest of the world in a particular place of honor. And therefore, a lot of excitement when the African Union was formed <coughs> with the vision that indeed it must be more, more interventionist, for instance, capable of intervening in any African country member state if crimes against the people were being committed, <coughs> like genocide and uh, crimes against humanity, unlike the, the OAU. <coughs> so we're very, very pleased indeed to host the formation, the, the launch of the African Union here, here in, in South Africa at the, at the Kings Park Stadium in, in Devon. So obviously it, it was uh, clear to us that therefore when the AU celebrates its 20th anniversary this year, it would be important that the Africa Day Lecture should address that matter. To say, uh, where are we? Where are we with regard to meeting all of the things that we promised ourselves 20 years ago? It's a challenging topic, um, and it seemed to us that we needed uh, a particularly skilled person to address this subject. Um, to say the positive things, to say the negative things, but in the end, to say maybe, maybe, to enable us to say, well, this is where we were 20 years ago, this is where we are now, and where do we want to be in 20 years' time? Which I think is very important for our continent. 
because all of us know as we starting from this country starting from this country we can see the challenges major major challenges that face us as Africans now professor Falola is, as has been said is uh, is many many extraordinary things he's a celebrated author editor of books writer poet academic leader organizer teacher pan africanist what else professor Falola should i say uh, author and editor of over 160 books on Africa and the African diaspora. Uh, one of Africa's preeminent historians, indeed one of the major intellectuals of our time. There is a, an annual international, international conference that's named after him as the Toyin Falola Annual Conference on Africa and African Diaspora, which meets every July in a major African university. The Association of Third World Studies has named its annual Best Book Award after him as the Toyin Falola Prize for the best book in Africa, on Africa. As has been indicated by uh, Professor Vilm Komo. Uh, Twain Falola has uh, done us a great, great honor of serving as the chair of the International Advisory Board of our African School on Public and International Affairs to bring all of that experience and knowledge to the building of this particular school so that it must be as excellent as he is. Um, apart from uh, being a professor at the University of Texas in Austin, of course, the honorary professor at the University of Cape Town, extraordinary professor of human rights at the Free State University, um, and therefore, even as South Africans, we are very, very proud and honored indeed that he interacts with us to bring to us this enormous volume of knowledge and wisdom and capacity, which surely must, must inspire us, as I was saying, to be as excellent as he is. Very, very proud, therefore, even when we asked him and said, Professor Falola, can you please talk to us about the AU at 20? He didn't hesitate, he immediately agreed to do that. Thank you very much, Professor Falola. Welcome, and I'm sure all of us are ready to listen to you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> And now, can we welcome our Nigerian professor in an African way and ululate? Excellency, President Mbeki, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Lenkabula, I stand on all existing protocol. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. I'm one of you. As many of my friends who are here know, I come here a lot. I want to start with a proverb. A heavy basket cannot be lifted to the head with one hand. It's a Yoruba adage 
with the meaning that one can only boast of a collective and cooperative front because an individual effort makes one susceptible to attacks and challenges. In English, you say united we stand, divided we fall. There are many variants of this adage, but the point is that collective effort leads to greater success, and this is the foundation of the African Union that we are gathered here today to celebrate 20 years of its existence. It's an evidence of a paradigm shift in continental ideology. The African dream took on a more profound continental hope and shape when African countries came together to plan on how to achieve independence across all sectors of African life and development. Before this, as President Mbeke reminded you, the Organization of African Unity attempted to promote unity and economic independence by upholding unique African social attributes and economic progress among all members. The history of the African Union is well known to many of you in this audience, and its problems are also well known. The swing shifted in 2001 when the OAU took decisive steps to refocus its objectives and structures to accommodate contemporary matters affecting us as well as a renewal of developmental strategies to match our realities. The African Union was founded in 2002 following a two-year process of thorough analysis of the former entity. It was a vigorous, robust conversation. The papers are available, the debates are important, and they represent major documents of the era. Since then, the AU has taken on a new duty, different from achieving independence from European colonial rule, and it has tried to focus more on preserving democratic principles. In this transition, and at this moment, we have to pay tribute to some of our ancestors who initiated many of these ideas as way back as the 19th century. Ancestors such as William Biden, Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, arguably the most preeminent intellectual of the last century, Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Yerere, and our own Tabo Mbeki, a visionary leader. Permit me to devote a few minutes on Tabo Mbeki himself. When scholars or individuals talk about the heroes of Africa and the most important players in the continent's transformation, they emphasize the contributions and achievements of early Pan-Africanists who fought for independence during the rebirth of the continent's cultural identity. However, as much as Africa's needs remain, and some people champion meeting those needs and carving new transformative blueprints for the continent, the valor of African heroes continues even in recent times. The contributions of great minds like President Mbeki to the progress of Africa have given flesh to my assertion. President Mbeki's contributions to reforming African dreams by supporting the creation of the African Union is the commencement of new African dreams, and we cannot overstate it, and we must praise it as a landmark. The existence of philosophy 
and ideology formed towards the development of the continent was one of the qualities of this visionary leader and, uh, and nationalist. Tabo Mbeki was one of those philosophical leaders who had a conviction about what Africa and its future should look like. He refused to be among those agitated by words alone. Instead, he cherished ideologies with notable actions that have made him a celebrated African visionary leader. President Mbeki believed in an African renaissance and held to that ambition to develop the continent. His speech to the South African Constitutional Assembly on May 8, 1996, titled I'm an African, made people understand his renaissance ambition for the continent. President Mbeki believed that there was a need to restructure the core agitations of the continent towards a renaissance that is socially imperative, that could be the only leeway to change, transformation, and the recovery of an African identity. President Mbeki, we cannot thank you enough. His views have been a clarion call for Africans and African leaders to wake up to reality and explore the advantages and benefits of globalization and transformative paradigm, paradigm shifts in the cultural evaluation of Africa. Why many will aim at achieving political independence of the continent, as seen from the early Pan-Africanist movements, President Mbeki's visions were more targeted towards the economic independence of the continent and a more pragmatic approach to solving current and evolving problems. These perspectives have been claimed to favor the aggrandizement of Africa's economic, social, and cultural status. He built on the ideas of Blyden, he built on the ideas of Du Bois, he built on the ideas of Nkrumah, and he shifted many of these ideas to economic paradigms. That shift that when Becky School, you have to study them uh, more robustly. The Renaissance is built on Africans' innate attributes, as Mbeki argues, which have been seen in our past history, like the architecture, hearts, creativity of African cultures, Nox civilization, and Egyptian innovations, among others. However, the ideas were open to foreign aims in order for Africa not to be self-destructive, considering the necessity of intercontinental cooperation. This reflects in President Mbeki's notable activities regarding the creation of NEPAD, and I was instrumental in getting the G8 countries to fund the agency. We cannot thank him enough. Mbeki's visions have been labeled neo-pan-Africanist and argued by different scholars, including myself, to be partly off the grid of pan-Africanism. However, one thing is certain about his ambitions for Africa and Africans. The core principles of Pan-Africanism are not in any way thrown to the wind by him, but are quite developed to take the visions of contemporariness and build a continent for the future. In fact, in his famous quote, I'm an African address, President Ibiki affirmed, probably unknowingly to him at that time, that his ideas were based on an Africans, on Africans and African values, and that African personality and Africanism are the bedrock of his Renaissance ideas. All these visions, his expectations, and how far the African Union has come could also be seen and appreciated in his address during the 10th anniversary of the African Union. With President Mbeki's spirit and conviction, coupled with the visions of other African leaders, there was an agreement on the need to rebut the continent's mission and goals and prepare it for the future. He and other leaders saw the need to link the OAU's long fights with our current and future needs of the continent. And this could be seen as a summary of the idea behind the proposal 
and adoption of the formation of the African Union. The African Union objectives and achievements built on many of the achievements of the organization of African unity, the need to modify the limitations of the OAU, the need to go beyond the failures of the OAU, the need to draw development issues into the platform of the OAU, the need to intervene more effectively in conflict areas. And the African Union set out as a symbol of hope for the renewed aspirations of Pan-Africanism, fusing previous ideas of many of our ancestors with some of the ideas of President Mbeki that I've outlined. To define the mission of the Union, it developed some 14 objectives for itself. This included guiding principles that will be material to the realization of these objectives. The renewed duties of the Union had the development of Africa and its member state as the core, the creation of an African economic community, ensuring good and, in, and uninterrupted governance, promotion of justice, promotion of equality, as well as development across health and other important sectors. One of the major characteristics of the new objectives was the absence of attention to the decolonization of the continent in contrast with the agenda of the OAU. Many of you have doubt the success and performance of the African Union. I hope to convince you this evening that it has achieved a lot. It has actually achieved tremendously. And I'm not talking from reviews of policy papers. I'm also talking from experience as someone who has been involved with many of his activities, most especially in the area of higher education. Many of you may not know that the African Union has established universities. It was a privilege for me to be at the convocation ceremony at the University of Ibadan, where they receive higher degrees. And we have redefined the issues around research grants to make it more relevant, to assess its impact, and we have reviewed the linkages with external colleagues and Africans abroad. Many of you may not know that it was very deliberative to redefine the number of African regions from five to move it to six, in which the entire body of African diaspora we now categorize them as Africa's sixth region. And to those of us who write books and test books, we are doing the linkages. We are trying to say we should not make a distinction between home and abroad and fuse them together. Many of you may not be aware that the African Union has insisted on the creation of African sixth region in all presidential offices They've created the African bond, and they have created linkages between those at home and those abroad. I am happy to be part of that great initiative. It's a symbol of hope, and the objectives have made the African Union preoccupied with the development of its member states. It has prioritized issues of economic interests more than ever before with solid documents on intergroup relations, intergroup trade, Africa free zone, ideas about developing an African currency. We've, it has launched an African Union passport. And when it's in due operation, I'm pleading to all of you to apply because you can use it to travel to all the countries in Africa. And we are thinking, uh, and some are thinking, in terms of reducing the number of customs and immigrations that you have to pass through. When this is in full operation, you can just get up and go to any African countries and just enter effortlessly. Many of these initiatives are not known because of the way 
communication works. Their ideas on sustainable development, the adoption of the principle of sovereignty, the adoption of the principles of maintaining peace, the adoption of the principles of quickly resolving conflicts. The African Union inherited the globalization attempts of the OAU and related challenges, including the risk of marginalization and separation within the continent. It, decisions have been taken with respect to globalization, and in recent time, the conversation has been about the revival of the non-alignment movement. This is the area where there's a lot of discussion driven by the current crisis in Ukraine. Should we revive the non-aligned movement? Seeing the new mission of the African Union and the expectations of Africans of what it can offer, it is important to ask if the African Union has been fulfilling its objectives. It's 20 years old this month, and that is about half of the life of its predecessor, the OAU. Is it on the course to actualize its mission? What are its challenges? If economic growth has been one of its most important objectives, how far has this been achieved? The economic growth pattern of the continent could be attributed to many factors, part of which will include an open trade system, foreign direct investment towards encouraging the growth of African economies. However, one of the most successful and progressive economic efforts was the embrace of industrialization, the recognition of the importance of the fourth industrial revolution, and attention given to the use of technology, the promotion of the internet, and focus on building human capacity. To encourage continuous growth, the African Union introduced the African Continental Free Trade Area, designed to affect 1.2 billion Africans with a gross domestic product of 2.5 trillion, and is anticipated to be the biggest free trade area globally. That document has been prepared. In achieving better economic growth for the continent, the Union has been in partnership with many countries, sub-regional organization, and to fulfill its commission towards maintaining peace and defending African citizens, the AU shifted to a strategic policy of promoting peace. In 2003, the AU was took interest in the four conflicts of Sudan. It was active in handling the conflict, and Professor, uh, President Mbeki was part of that initiative. You already know the story of Sudan. Based on this agreement, the U.S. also created the Emmys mission in Sudan, and its involvement, its great involvement, prevented the loss of millions of lives. In Libya, the AU took reasonable steps in the conflicts involving the government of Gaddafi. And that conflict became complicated when foreign countries threw themselves uh, into the situation. Many of you are also familiar with the opposition of the AU to that foreign intervention. Uh, so another example was the creation in 2007 of the African Union mission in Somalia to resolve the Somali crisis. And the intervention of the African Union reduced the death of thousands of lives. The adoption of the African Union's Constitutive Act was proof of the renewed commitment to the protection of human rights and the promotion of value for the dignity of human persons as a value. The AU has been able to build on the foundation for the general protection of human rights on the continent. The Maputo Summit of the African Union witnessed the redefinition 
of the African commitment to women's rights. I've seen in this hall two people who are part of this initiative. Adopting the Maputo Protocol on African women's rights has been a commendable step that showcases the commitment to women's rights. Today, the participation of women in African politics keeps increasing. We need more, but we've produced women as presidents, including the current president of Tanzania. Promoting democracy, human rights, and good governance, these are part of the focus of the union. We've created the charter on democracy, on government, on elections, and a department of political affairs with a commissioner who monitors many of these activities. I've said all this just to mention uh, some major contributions. But we have challenges, we have failures, and disappointment that I will talk about. When the African Union was instituted in 2001, it was a conviction that there would finally be an answer to all the problems that militated against the continent and where it did not resolve them immediately. The ambition was big, the expectations were many. It was expected that the spirit of Pan-Africanism would permit all aspects of our politics and development. A different dimension in trafficking affairs and relationships between member states, especially in their internal affairs, was expected to broaden the scope of human rights, deserving development, and sustainable economic edification. Despite all the promises, achievements, and actions of the African Union, the important question is whether the AU has been able to fulfill the purpose for which it was created. What are the loose ends? As I stand before you today, we have problems that we worry about. We worry about the coups coming back to Africa. We worry about state capture in Nigeria and South Africa. We worry about implosion in the Sahel. We worry about issues of migrations. We worry about issues of the high rate of unemployment. And we worry about our youth who want to leave the continent, taking difficult decisions, crossing the long Sahara Desert. We worry about, many of you in this audience worry about. And the search for more express an evident unity of Africa, which has been the purpose of the OAU and the purpose of the AU, we also worry about all those. The understanding that informed the agitation for African progress regarding integration, regarding regionalism, we worry about all those. What I'm trying to say is that there's nothing that you worry about that they do not worry about in the AU. There is no problem in the African nation states that those who work as commissioners in the commission, the civil, uh, hardworking civil servants who work there, there is no issue that they are not aware or they do not care about. They call for progress. They call for good institutions. They call for good leadership. And the institutionalization of the African peer review mechanism, which has met in South, in South Africa several times, and the new Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD, both have allowed for action towards uniform adoption of standards, practices, and policies targeted at sustainable development and growth in all areas of African society. There's so many conversations on the issues of development. The AU has hoped that a major increase in the chances of developing African states 
true strategic efforts will possibly impact all Africans. The view is that development is meant to occur and maximally impact and change our people's economic and social progress. The AU is aware of the poverty rate of Africans and its figure as of 2019 that about 34% of Africans still live below 1.9 US dollar per day poverty line. That 59% fall below the three dollars per day and 80% live below five dollars per day. All these figures, the AU has collected them and so many worries have been expressed. The estimated number of Africans living in extreme poverty has been put at 478 million. That is a large number. And as a result of the global commercial and economic shutdown caused by COVID-19 epidemic, this figure climbed to 490 million Africans living below $2 per day. From 2000 to 2020, there was a small decrease in the number of poor people in Africa, tending to the efforts of respective nations and, other, uh, and the union. But the impact of COVID, and currently the impact of the war in Ukraine, is causing some major concern. The AU is aware of the falling standard of living of Africans in relation to development is a way of limited infrastructural development in almost all African countries. It's a way of the challenges of the limitations of job. Conversations have been held on how to diversify the economy with strategies from African countries in partnership with the African Union. There are conversations in 10 countries to, to further develop their growing economies. There are efforts to, to use as linchpin the economies of Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, Mozambique, Zambia, and Ethiopia to impact on the economies of other countries. The AU has a blueprint on development of roads, access to motorable and good roads, which is about 34% as against the international standard of 50%. You may wonder, am I talking about documents? Yes, there are great documents. And am I talking about some activities? Yes, there are activities. Are these activities enough? No, they are not enough. Despite the efforts of the African Union, it seems that there are examples to substantiate an argument for the trending reversal of democracy in Africa. You and I are worried about this democratic recession. This recession undermines the efforts of the AU and casts doubts on the fulfillment of the reason behind its creation. You are right to express your doubts. Aside from the efforts of the AU, in the promotion and protection of democratic government, there are numerous other attempts to keep the democratic promise of the African Union. And one of the most promising was the adoption of the Charter of Democracy. Can the OAU manage the democratic recession? Can the AU prevent the comeback of the military? We cannot approve and disapprove simultaneously some of these activities. The AU has essentially not been stable in many of its commitments to promoting democracy in Africa. And its inconsistency has opened the union to legitimate criticism. In issues around elections, in issues around whose legitimate criticisms have been offered. Despite the union's efforts to make the continent grow economically and promote democracy, there have been about 
40 attempted coups since 2010 and about 12 successful coups that removed elected government and replaced them with military rule. The predominance of military coups, although caused by frustrating situations of individual countries, has been a major challenge to the commitment of the AU against any assault on elected government and issues around political stability in Africa. If you have cause to worry, I will join you in that worry. The situation has deteriorated to the point that we now ask if coups are returning to Africa and whether the African Union has failed in its promise to safeguard democracy. Some of us have suggested the need to rethink the representations in all the regional bodies in, in the African Union because representations are based on recommendations by presidents of countries, by politicians in countries. In our study of the ECOWAS, we realize that it is the politicians that sponsor their friends to represent their countries in ECOWAS. And when major decisions occur, they do not decide as we expect, simply because they are playing the politics of those who put them there. Some of us are beginning to suggest that our representatives in the African Union should be people like you, and should include people like you and I, who will not be connected to the politicians in our respective countries. Why the AU can make declarations, adopt protocols, offer statements on its position against or for a particular action. One of the consistent problems associated with the union is the difficulty in enforcing its decisions and actions. And on this, all international organization, whether it's the African Union or the EU, suffer from this problem. To strengthen its enforcement and protection of human rights, the AU established the African Court on Human and People's Rights in 2004. It's an impressive document, and people are challenging the AU to move more aggressively towards its implementation. In respect to the commitment of the AU to the position on election, the principle of responsibility to protect the security challenges and instabilities in some countries, many are suggesting a revision of many of his policy papers. Nigeria, Kenya, Mali, Chad, Central African Republic, Mozambique, Somalia, and many others have been at the receiving end of radical Islamist bombardment and victimization. Islamic extremism in Nigeria and Kenya has become more damaging. Since 2009, the Boko Haram group in Nigeria has been responsible for over 40,000 deaths, displacement of 3 million people, attacks on Catholic citizens. Many are calling on the AU for its intervention. So there are challenges in the area of terrorism and politics that we have to worry about. Regarding sustainable development, which is the, one of the core principles of the AU, the standard of measurement for the progress of every society and government is the extent of its development. First, we battle with the deeper coups of our development in, in almost all sectors of our economy. Second, we are beginning to see a major rise in external debts and some countries are now using a percentage of their annual revenues to finance their debts, including South Africa. We're witnessing the impact of globalization 
in ways that we cannot fully control. In order to reduce poverty rate in the continent, we have to harness our resources. As everyone will attest, our economic history shows the continent is dependent on agricultural resources and practices. And we must not go too far in the search for other sustainable resources. Agricultural development is a stimulator for ensuring multidimensional development that touches almost all aspects of society. It sp spreads to food security, elevation of poverty, economic development, infrastructural development, and many more. And many people are suggesting that the AU, in partnership with the African Agri Development Bank, various countries must pay more attention to agriculture. To boost the African economy, we need to focus on incorporating resources and raw materials production, which we have to use internally instead of exporting them. And while other nations make deliberate attempts towards sustainable development in their respective countries, the African environment must be treated with unique consideration. Our dream of a united front toward African cultural sustenance and development is a core duty of the AU as an appropriate body to achieve these desires. At its inception, the AU inherited a pan-African orientation that builds a collective approach to world views and economic development. The issue of sustainable development must remain at the core of what the AU will continue to promote and do. One major impediment is the, con is the recurrent political instability and security challenges faced by many of our countries. The continuous subversion of political institutions, terrorist attacks, will not allow the AU and African countries to focus on the development of Africa across all sectors. And a new security challenge has opened up in internet and a wide range of cyber security. And we have to pay attention to what to do with imagined threat from cyber attacks. Many of you have heard about the Agenda 2063. And this Agenda 2063, I want to talk about because it now constitutes the overarching core of the program of the AU. For the past 20 years, the African Union has recorded commendable achievements. It has failed noticeably in many areas. It has battled recurrent and momentary challenges. The Union has gone through transformational processes that have been able to make it adjust its orientation towards the current needs of the continent. While we might be concerned about the past and current actions of the AU, we must always be ready to draw back and ask if the AU has a plan for the future. Unsurprisingly, the African Union has been able to reel out plans covering the continent's current and future challenges. The Agenda 2063 is one of such futuristic agreements and subscriptions that the African nations have decided to execute. There's a consensus around Agenda 2063. In recognition of the need to salvage the African society from continued problems of underdevelopment and ensure social and economic growth, the African leaders and the African Union realized that there was a need to build a sustainable plan that would be inspired by Pan-African values, which is inclusive towards all African countries. Upon this realization, the Agenda 2063, which projects forward 50 years of deliberate and coordinated plans towards African development, and a definitive voice in the international community 
had to be built. The Agenda 2063 is a source of solutions that will be drawn from Africa itself and allow the continent to take lessons from the achievements and failures of the, of the past. The plan is intended to provide enough opportunities over 50 years to positively influence the socioeconomic development of the continent by 2063. If you have not seen the document, please try to look for it. It is ambitious, it's expansive. It's built upon three principles, prosperity, unity and peace to be enjoyed by all Africans without reservation. It's divided into the short span, the medium and the long-term goals, 10 years, 25 and 50 years. At the Golden Jubilee celebration of the OAU in 2013, the Agenda 2063 project was aimed at resuscitating and attaining the full African identity, eradicating every form of colonialism in contemporary society, promoting good governance and democracy, including security assurance, despite the present bottlenecks. The AU and African leadership intend to reach this goal through a continuous partnership with other international bodies and organizations and African countries to arrive at a sustainable approach for intentional management of such long-term projects in the right trajectory. The Union's implementation plan included the reliance on the youth who are the most appropriate beneficiaries of this project, the women who are currently marginalized, and likewise, Africans in diaspora for the assurance of sustainable monitoring of the agenda's implementation. The African Union has been deliberate in seeing to the success of this agenda by departmentalizing it into three. The strategic plan that consists of the objectives and aspirations of the Union for Africa by 2063. The implementation plan to ensure the actualization of those plans, a monitoring and evaluation framework to consistently check the progress and delay in the plans, in addition to providing the right solutions through feedbacks. South Africa is involved in monitoring this agenda. And our colleagues at the University of Free State have, have contributed in monitoring these contributions through conferences to which have been invited and to which we will continue to monitor the progress of Agenda 2063. While the African Agenda 2063 is important and commendable, many factors will have to be implemented to ensure that the plan does not change, extended, or disposed of before or after the time frame. The AU must learn to ensure that the implementation and monitoring institutions of the project are well equipped across this time, and its operation must be inclusive of all the African societies and cultures. This is to ensure that the plan does not fail as a result of a lack of implementation and monitoring institutions. The AU must ensure that it achieves a common understanding of the agenda across all its member states to ensure uniformity of purpose and development. To achieve this, the Union must increase its efforts towards achieving unity among African states, ensuring full cooperation of our countries and stakeholders. More so, for this plan to succeed, it must be powered by a prepared and understanding human force. And in order to achieve such a prolonged continental project, it is important that the African Union must intensify its agitation for basic education and encourage meaningful investment in science and technology to prepare the population for and ahead of the 2063 20, realization deadline. More so, it is important to enhance and recommend the embrace 
of continuous research in all our universities, in all fields, to increase the possibility of innovative breakthroughs that will aid the actualization of this vision. And in giving its new grants, the AU is insisting on research that is connected to this agenda. We, you and I must treat this agenda in respect of each specific country based on their spe specific and special needs. A general approach towards development may result in unanticipated marginalization that will see progressive execution in some parts and failure in others. Thus, a deliberate effort must be made to ensure that each country is carried along with its counterparts and that there should be a quick reaction to any incident that may impede the actual actualization of the project in each country. This means that all sectors, all organs, all institutions, all commissions of the African Union must be focused consciously on the actualization of this project. The AU and its other institutions and programs that have developed over the years have endeavored to ensure progressive cooperation among African countries. To achieve this, it is believed that Africa must be taken collectively with reasonable immigration and trade policies that to allow the free flow of human and material resources within our continent. This aligns with the early Pan-African ideologies that view Africa as one body, protecting and promoting a common identity. Aside from this ideology, individuals have found the need to migrate and extend commercial activities outside their immediate societies, either temporarily or permanently in human history. And this phenomenon is not going to stop anytime soon. International migration in Africa has to be connected to issues of development, of growth, and cooperation dreams of the continent. However, as you and I know, we are dealing with xenophobic attacks in different parts of the continent. And the problem might not have attracted the attention of the world or academia, but it's a major threat to continental cooperation xenophobia and Afrophobia linked with misconstrued nationalism and ethnocentrism have never been good for our development hopes. This problem must be addressed by the AU and reaffirm the commitment of member states to ensuring that such acts are not tolerated. The union must be assertive with its stance against xenophobia, ensure community education, embark on projects that will ensure high circulation of job opportunities, no matter the origin of any individual. Xenophobia, Afrophobia, and their respective attacks are threats to African unity and a step towards killing the ambition of people who dream, who dream about beautiful African future. Have devoted this lecture to the unity of states and countries as the embodiment of the African Union. In doing this, we have limited the scope of our conversation. And it is time that you and I begin to talk about the unity of culture, the African taste of food, our commonality in music, our interest in films, how our people are united, if you are from West Africa, you see the massive migrations of Yoruba people to Gambia. If you visit Nairobi, you see trucks carrying food from Tanzania and Uganda. We do not speak about the unity of culture. We do not speak about the unity of our people. We do not have data on marriages. We do not have data on our people. We do not have data on interactions using religion how people from South Africa, from Tanzania, go to churches in Nigeria, how Nigerian pastors operate in Kenya, we do not talk about that. 
And it is time you and I begin to extend our research into the unity among our people and how the use of languages, the use of idioms, the commonalities of our ideas make us uh, who we are. We do not talk about that, but it's very extensive. Neither do we talk about the extensive migration within Africa. We talk about the flow of migration from Africa to the West. But you may not know that more people migrate within Africa itself. I once served on the Commission of Afro-Arab Summit under Mubarak. And Mrs. Mubarak was a good host supplying us with data. Two million people move with that, within that region every year. That's far more than Africans who leave Africa. We do not talk about that. The director of the program, the vice chancellor, members of the audience, let me close this lecture. And in closing it, I want to return to a statement made in 2002 by President Tabo Mbeki. And I want to quote him. We must act together to build a brighter future. Working together with all of us, governments, parliamentarians, trade unions, private sector, civil society, religious communities, cultural workers for a better future for the peoples of Africa. And I want to throw challenges using this quotation. And the first challenge will go to Professor Fi Nkomo, who has been given the leadership opportunity to lead the team at his school. In our disappointment in the limitations of Africa, one of the agendas of the T Mali School is to give us solutions to this problem. Professor V. Nkomo, we expect a lot from you. And we have seen the agenda of the school covering areas of international affairs, governance, citizenship, development, leadership taught, and we believe that the results of research coming from your school will transform this continent. My second challenge is to our youth, that you have a mandate, a great mandate, to build on our inheritances. My generation may have disappointed us, may have disappointed you, Forgive us and correct our mistakes. We've heard you clearly. And we understand that we may have failed you, but you have to move forward without us. And in moving forward, you have to do better than us and spend more time thinking about transformation than about our failure. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa will be defined by success. The success of our humanity, which nobody can take away from us. The success of our humility, which is well known. The success of our resilience. We survived the Atlantic slave trade. We're still here. We survived genocide, we are still here. We survived imperialism, we are still here. We survived colonization, we are still here. We survived poverty, we are still here. We survived COVID, we are still here. There is nothing we are not going to survive. The success of our endurance, 
Nobody is celebrating agonies and poverty. But we overcome. The success of our hope, which no one can take away from us. The success of our enormous capacity to turn our pain into our gains. And our gains we multiply and multiply overcoming our pains. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Falola, for that comprehensive overview and that hopeful assessment. You have touched our hearts. So at this stage of our program, it becomes your turn. And wow, when I look at our audience tonight, we see that beauty of Africa all around our audience. Dr. Geraldine Fraser Moloketi and others coined a term called fashionomics. And it speaks to some of the creative energy that we as African people bring, the beauty that we as African people bring. And so right now, I'm going to hand you over to our professor, Edith Paswana. She's the director of our academic programs, so there's a heavy mantle on her head with a school that is in its early stages. And she's associate professor as well at our TM school. In her own words, she describes herself as an Afro-decolonial Afro thought leader. She was the distinguished humanities lecturer in 2014, she was one of the Mail and Guardian top 100 women, and I'm not including all her publications and scholarly contributions, but she's also co-editor of the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences award-winning title, Black Academic Voices in 2020. So I'm going to hand over to Prof. Edith Paswana and just take a look at this fashion, uh, fashionomics, because if you see the green of Professor Falola and the green of Professor Paswana, we here have testimony to the beauty of our Africa. She will take you through your part of the program, which is now your questions and answers. Welcome, Prof. Paswana. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director, uh, Professor Miller. Thank you. Um, His Excellency, the Chancellor of UNISA, the patron of Tabumbek Foundation, and our patron at the TM School, uh, the former president of South Africa, uh, the Vice Chancellor in absentia here, Professor Lenkabula the Vice-Chancellor and Principal of UNISA, our distinguished guest speaker, uh, one of our eminent scholars on the continent, Professor Falola. Let me stand on the existing uh, protocol and say to all of us distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. <laughs> Professor Falola, welcome to South Africa and welcome to the TM School. You remain one of our eminent uh, scholars 
in the diaspora. Uh, authentic in my language, which is Sutu Salibua. They say, and I have seen that you remain an African in the West, and this is to be applauded. For all of us here in the continent as Africans, we feel proud to see uh, people like you standing up for Africa on the continent. This dialogues, uh, the Tabumbeki Africa uh, Day Lecture, are, are part of engaged scholarship at our school and at UNISA, and is a partnership with the Tabumbeki Foundation. And I also am mentioning this because I want to applaud you for your thoughtfulness in crafting this lecture that we are speaking to communities at home. And I think you will, uh, <laughs> you'll be pleased to know now that the book is published, maybe I can speak about it. You didn't know, the University of Rochester asked me to review your recent publication uh, uh, that you published, Decolonizing African Studies. It was a long book, African, uh, Decolonizing African Studies, almost 700 pages. And I was privileged to, to, to look at that. And that's why I'm mentioning your ability now, because I read your book and the language you used in the book, but I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating that you took uh, cognizance of the fact that we are talking to communities at home and uh, you did this very beautifully for all of us, highlighting the achievements of, of the continent over the past 20 years. You know, 20 years, it's, uh, it's like it's an age, uh, you, are, you are coming of age in Africa. Of course, we come of age 21 years, but yes, at 20, uh, the AU has actually come of age. And thank you also for paying homage to the leadership of President Mbeki his role in providing the architecture for the reconstruction of the continent, and also you have characterized his leadership as a leadership that built on the successes of the past, uh, which was political liberation, and he had a vision for the economic growth and development of the continent, and this is highly, highly appreciated in the lecture. And I want to zoom now and zero in to some of these achievements and challenges that you have highlighted tonight and uh, try to ask you to reflect uh, on, on, on what you mentioned as the challenges and particularly as it related to the coups. 40 attempted coups, you said, coup, and 12 successful ones. Prof, this is not really pleasing for the continent. In 2020, we were meant to silence the guns. Why are the coups coming back? That's my first question to you to reflect on. Why are they coming? Why is there a return of these coups? And then you also mentioned one of the successes or the achievements of the continent. You outline them beautifully, African currency, uh, the free trade zone area, uh, passports, all of those important uh, successes that you have outlined for us. But people on the ground, Africans on the ground, particularly young people, we are losing them to Euro, North America, and China. Why is that? And I'm going to allow you, Prof, to reflect on these two questions before I hand you over to, to the audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And I appreciate your understanding of the trust of the lecture and your broadening the issue. If you Google my name, I wrote an essay in newspapers, including one published in Johannesburg, Akus Back in Africa. And 
we have to put considerable blame on the failure of democratic institutions, on the del deliverables of democracy. We have colleagues who used to be socialists who turned to socialites. And we have colleagues who promoted democracy but who turned to militocracy. When democracy doesn't deliver progress, when it doesn't deliver development, if people cannot put food on their table, it, they would begin to worry whether this democracy works for them. I'm sure there are people in this audience who knew the great initiative made in Egypt where we gathered and said, can we not define democracy on our own terms? And we rejected his liberal definition of dividing power into three, the organs of government. And we were definitive to say that democracy in Africa must include issues of food, issues of education, issues of water supply. We were insistent that we cannot define operate democracy outside of development. If you live in Western societies and you follow their debates, you often wonder, are these not debates based on the fact that they have no problems? <laughs> but you cannot live in Africa and not worry about food, about potholes. You have to worry about them, about erratic electricity supply, about water shortage. So if you live in Mali and there's no water, if you live in Uganda and there's no electricity, you begin to question leadership and you begin to question democracy. And there, there will be feedback to those in the police. There will be feedback to those who are in the military. And those feedback will pressure politics. We're in that situation. I like the conversation of guns. AK-47 is all over Africa. Many of you have studied the Atlantic slave trade and studied the Middle Passage. But many may not know there is that reversal of the Middle Passage. There is now rapid traffic from South America to West Africa. It's very rapid. The slaves that took slaves to the Americas is now bringing guns and drugs. Very rapid. And many people are not paying attention to that. They used to think that these guns come across the Atlantic. So uh, international bodies, the African Union, must collaborate because they know these gun producers. They have to do naval blockage, just as it did in the 19th century to stop the Atlantic slip trade. Because that's where they come from. And as long as these guns are available, the crisis will continue in Central African Republic. The entire Sahel region has imploded. Two committees have been set up. France set up one led by one of the professors here, actually. Mbembe, another commission was set up in which I serve to look at the Sahel. We wrote a 2,000 page report that these places are imploding and we have to check this implosion. But more importantly, we have to see the extent to which these guns are damaging us. Our people are doing this interregional trade 
This interregional flow, you and I have actually not studied them. We do, I don't know how many of you travel in East Africa, in West Africa. This is very extensive. It's very, very extensive. If, if you go on major roads between Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, you see those trucks. There's so many. Kung Fu, the same thing in West Africa. The same thing. Uh, tomatoes produced in the Republic of Benin coming to Nigeria, close from Abelkuta, going as far as Gambia. We have to empower this traffic. We have to make them grow more. We, do, we have not up until now studied effectively the informal sector in African economies. These informal sectors are huge. They are very expansive. We do not know the tax base. We do not know, we do not know the volume. But look at all the streets. Look at all the countries. Go to Lagos. Between the time you leave your office and get home, you've done all your shopping on the streets. You've bought your tomato, your beef, you just get home and cook them. But we have, we have not built a data bank on them. And precisely, we have not studied survival mechanism in Africa. You read the Chicago Times, the New York Times, they will say, people survive in Africa on one dollar or two dollars. I say, okay, come, I will buy you a ticket. I will send you to Lagos. I will give you $30. In fact, I will give you $60. Come back. Let me know whether you will not be, whether you'll be alive. Precisely, we do not know how millions and millions of our people actually live. The reason is that we have a cultural network. I am sure there's nobody in this room, when you are paid at the end of the month, that every that money you spend on your own. No, that's not how we are as Africans. You sponsor five people, I sponsor five people, those don't go into any database. And the very fact that these communities work for us is one of the very things we must never give up. When you do wedding ceremony, social payment, funeral ceremony, social payment, we have not studied the social payments. So there's so many things in our continent we need to pay attention to, things that make things work for us that do not enter for my economies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now close, open up for, for the audience. Um, I'm hoping there are roaming mics for our audience. Can I see an indication? Yes, thank you. <coughs> uh, let me do some of the housekeepings uh, for, for our audience as we take questions. I will first take um, a round of three questions from three persons. And I uh, will proceed to the, to, I'll come back to Professor Falola, and then I'll take another three if time allows. And <coughs> that's true, we are working on time here. And I will also request that we don't make preludes, forward, context, background, purpose of the question. We ask short, <laughs> <laughs> Please, let's try to be short and precise in our questioning. Uh, please, distinguished guests, I beg you, and so that we can have other questions, other people asking. And uh, also, I'm going to request that we don't do those long, convoluted questions that we may not even know. Prof might not even know how to answer them. So. I am seeing a hand there in the front, and I think it's one of our alumni. I want to look at him. Yeah. Oh, that's him. The gentleman there. Uh, and then the we have, oh, this one has a mic already. 
Okay, let's start with the one who has a mic already, then we'll come to you. And now I'm going to be gender biased, I'm looking for a woman. Um, okay. Yes. To uh, There's a lady with an orange and black. But just here, right in front. Okay, I'll greet you all. Uh, my name is Zili Joseph Lokwapi. Uh, it's quite interesting on what the issues you are dealing with now. My question is simple and straightforward. Africa is a rich continent. Africa has resources. Africa has soil. Yet, Africans who stay in Africa, they are poor. What is it which the scholars and the politicians, also those who are in, business, in the economic sphere, are they doing to make sure that Africa rises beyond its means? Because we cannot uh, provide Europe or the West with our own things, yet our people are suffering at the ground. I mean, the issue of the war in Russia and Ukraine, it was not supposed to be affecting us here in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. We are not even part and parcel of it. <laughs> here in Africa we have oil, but our oil is not used by Africans. Yeah. Here in Africa we have diamonds, we have gold, but our minerals are not used by us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can take your seats. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Simo Zulu. I am um, an alumni of uh, Timali, which is now the TM School. Um, I have lots of questions, but we will engage after this, Prof. I have one question. Kwame um, Nkuruma said Africa must unite. Africa must unite. The question that I believe we must ask ourselves is Africa united? And if not, why is Africa not united? It's a very big question. It's a research question. I can, I volunteer to be a scribe for you, Prof, to do this. <laughs> but I can tell you that there are things that militate against the unity of the African continent. And one of them is our colonizing overlord our colonizing overlord. Till today, there's a colonizing overlord that is taking charge of our lives. Now, the question that we must also ask is, what is it that we need to do to liberate ourselves from the yoke, from the tyranny, from the oppression of the colonizing overlord? Thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Uh, there's a lady here. I have recognized this lady here with an orange and black. Please, thank you. Um, thank you so much. My name is Lerato and I'm a student at UNISA. Um, long distance, hey. <laughs> so, quick one, Professor. I'm sorry to say this, but I'm not ready to, to, as a young person sitting in this room, I'm not ready to forgive uh, those who came before me. I'm not ready. The reason for that is because you guys sit at the AU without us. What is it that you're doing that involves us? Have you heard of what is it that we want as, as African youth? We have ideas, we're working so hard, but we are not involved. Does the AU have a youth organization? Does SADC have a, a youth organization? You don't have that, but you keep on saying you have a plan for 2063. I'll be 63 by that time. I'll be 70 by that time, I think. But what is it that you're doing to involve us? We want to stay here. We don't want to work abroad. Like, like I'm saying now, I'm a UNISA student, but I'm a transfer pricing specialist. My skills are so rare in SA. They are so rare that when you open your email every now and again, you get an email saying that, I have an offer for you in Dubai. I have a job for you in the UK, because my skills are so rare. So I don't want to go, I want to be here. I want to rebuild my continent. So what are you doing to involve me as a young person? Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Prof, I'm happy I'm not you tonight. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you very much. You know, we are all sinners. <laughs> and on a daily basis, we seek repentance. And I know some of us will not be forgiven because the sins are too many. But people like President Mbiki and myself, whose sins are few, will be forgiven. <laughs> the point about youth involvement is a bigger conversation which is being held in all countries. Not too young to run is a slogan that you find. And in the last three years, you find slash NSAS in Nigeria, youth, big youth, protest against the police, Zambia, Liberia, Syria alone, youth massive movement in Uganda, movement against sexual harassment, against rape. These challenges are ongoing. They're vibrant and we must encourage them to influence politics. Many of you are familiar with my writing. I have made major speeches in March at the University of Jomo Kenyatta. I advanced the argument that the theories that drive conversations today, cosmopolitanism, Afropolitanism, Afrofuturism, they do not hold to my generation, but to your generation. And that that theoretical platform, which is reshaping the knowledge system, is also connected to the major achievements of our young men and women. And yesterday, I challenged the team at the school, and I was very, very honest in saying that the three dominant frontiers of our empowerment, of our transformation, none of it holds to our professors. None of it derives from our universities. I'm sure they were embarrassed, just as I too was embarrassed, that how can we have these universities and our three frontiers of transformation do not hold to these universities? What are these? The expansiveness of the creative industry in music, in fashion, in films. Hold to precisely what you are talking about and it is not the knowledge we produce in the universities that produce the third biggest film industry in the world. The witches in Hollywood movies that you enjoy watching in South Africa. <laughs> Some of you are addicted to Nigerian movies. <laughs> if you go to the government hall in Pretoria in front of the hall, they sell the Nigeria movies there. They do not hold to the UNISA or to the University of Lagos. We are very grateful to you, young men and young women, for reviving the African stories, for reviving the African traditions, for repackaging mythologies and science fiction and combining them 
in the most creative ways. And South Africa is also producing great movies that are on Netflix, local stories. The extensive nature of fashion, the creative aesthetics, they are generated by young men and women outside of the university space. And the globalization of the African music industry, one of the most successful in post-colonial Africa, does not hold to universities. As we are teaching them piano, they threw away the piano and went to gongs and drums. <laughs> there is no club tonight in Johannesburg that will not play Davido. <laughs> or Simi, or Gold, or Jerusalem. Jerusalem in three weeks had 45 million views. That's not a UNISA product. <laughs> so, it's a challenge for universities that as a youth empower themselves, not only are we going to buy their knowledge, you have bought into their knowledge of Afrofuturism. Indeed, on Wednesday in Zurich, I'll be talking about Afrofuturism, which is not a theory that holds to me. It's a theory that holds to you. So you have not been ignored. And because you have not been ignored, and you are transforming us, and when Nigeria recalibrated its economy, moving ahead of South Africa as the largest economy in Africa, you know what made it possible? Fashion, Nollywood, and Davido. That's it. So you have actually forgiven us only that you don't know. <laughs> because in creating these theories, in creating this creativity, in reviving our culture, creating music, creating new poems, creating new stories, you have said, Mbeki, you are an old man. You want to move forward. And we thank you for moving forward. Why are we not using African resources? UNISA has contributed to this dialogue. Blue Fountain has contributed to this dialogue. They've been initiating conversation on illicit flows. And T Mali School, because I'm a member of the board, I know what they teach, is developing a cluster of knowledge around illicit flow and development. And they are calculating how much we lose. I'm extending your question. $85 billion leave Africa every year. Just merely because of legal papers that we sign, illicit contracts we append our signature to. Not including theft of oil, theft of timber, theft of gold. I was telling President Mbeki in the car that there's a region in Nigeria called Sanfara. It has gold. They're stealing the gold. Sometimes in the middle of the night, they will bring a helicopter to steal the gold. Mali is a gold producer. It has no gold reserve. France does not produce gold. It has gold reserve. And that, that is the dilemma we face. Why is Africa not uniting? We are uniting and we are disuniting. Because as I said in the lecture, if you look at it at the state level, at the level of the state, you will come to that conclusion. If you look at the level of the people, you will reach a different conclusion. Africa is not a surveillance state. The West is a surveillance state. A surveillance state collects data on virtually everything. I'm from Ibadan, Nigeria. If you ask me how many people died in Ibadan last year, I don't know. You don't know. The government does not know. Because we're a non-surveillance state, no one can tell you and me 
How many South Africans are married to Nigerians? We don't know. How many Nigerians are married to Ghanaians? We don't know. How many children every year do we produce that are multinational, multicultural? We don't know. What is the traffic in trade? We don't know. So that unity is ongoing. Only that because we are not a surveillance state, we don't track them. As to the level of the state, you have answered the question the fragmentation, the disaster of colonization, neocolonization, the perpetual desire to make us fragment, fight one another. But we are going to overcome, and we surely will overcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to look at our program director, if we still have time, and I think uh, all of them are, sh are showing me we are at the end. That is very sad, I know. We were just allocated this thing five minutes, but I think we were able to engage with our lecture. My bosses are showing me that it's time up, and I want to go to work on Monday. And, and get my salary. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Professor, thank you so much. Thank you for taking us through. And I want to thank the audience also for their engagement. Let's continue the conversations in our universities, in our communities as well. And let's do likewise also on our online chats here at UNISA. And thank you, viewers at home, uh, for participating in this uh, dialogue. Thank you. I know we're coming across as spoilers at this point. And I do just want to say that even President Mbeki said no when we tried to, to indicate that it's time. So I'd like to start out by thanking our patron, uh, President Thabo Mbeki and Mrs. Zanelli Mbeki, not only for their pioneering work, but allowing us to use their names to carry out activities and functions of this nature. Professor Tuyin Falola, we are eternally grateful to you for this thought-provoking and inspirational lecture. More importantly, for your willingness to engage with other stakeholders and colleagues at the Tabumbeki African School. You raised a number of issues tonight, and I'm not here to summarize that. I simply wanted to lift one or two nuggets that you have raised. You spoke about success of Africans, the success of our endurance, but you warned us that no one is celebrating poverty and we should turn our pain into success and achievement. Over the past uh, few days, you've also put out there that in Africa we talk about the we rather than the nation. You spoke about us weaponizing ethnicity. You juxtaposed this whole issue of the frontier and citizenship. And you said we are caught in the frontier concept. You also went further over these days and spoke to a question that came up through the challenge by the young woman and, uh, who spoke earlier, where you said new colonization is taking place because the young and old are not talking to each other. And you raised the challenge, can Africa create a modern state? And you also juxtapose the whole idea 
the notion of running a country as a king rather than a president. As a president, you run a country according to a constitution. As a king, you are guided by convention. But let me continue with the thank yous and acknowledgements. So I'd like to also thank uh, Professor Lenka Bulle, the Vice Chancellor of UNISA, the Council and Management of UNISA for embracing our partnership and contributing to this amazing event today, one that's being watched from across the world and from within this room. Professor Sibusiso Vilankomo, I'd like to thank you for your steady leadership. And I'd like to extend that to the colleagues at the TM School, because we're going to rely on you to turn your scholarly work, to turn this lecture into ongoing dialogue about the future of our continent. And you've heard Professor Falula's really prof place quite a burden on your shoulder. We sort of pushed from the foundation, but he stated it quite clearly. And in this instance, I think accountability is not even a question. To the board of the Tabumbeki Foundation, who in their wisdom felt it necessary that this lecture become, becomes a permanent feature of our annual calendar and our annual political calendar, I'd just like to say thank you. To the Marketing and Communications Department at UNISA for all the logistical support they provided uh, to this event, including the raise in temperatures at times. It was wonderful to watch that and see us pull through. And to the staff at the Tabumbeki Foundation, I'd like to thank you for all the hours and the sleepless nights you've put in to ensure this event becomes the success it is. As a matter of fact, how does the saying go, Nangomso? So we're not thanking you for today and yesterday. We're thanking you for tomorrow. And the same goes to the UNISA team. More importantly, though, the driver, manager, and coordinator of this event, Lupi, now I run the risk of massacring your surname, but let me try anyway. Aisa and the team, you've really outdone yourself. We wish as a foundation to, appreci the uh, to appreciate the support and cooperation from many South Africans present here today and at home for the continuous material and otherwise support you've provided to our foundation. And we'd also want to thank those Africans in the room and elsewhere in the continent outside of South Africa for your ongoing support and of course, I won't forget the fifth region, the diaspora as well. It's an occasion to acknowledge all of you by name as we will shortly be approaching our patron's birthday. Friends, colleagues, comrades, fellow Africans in this hall, at home and the diaspora, and I'm repeating this, we thank you for joining us tonight. We hope that this has been an occasion for all of us to rededicate ourselves to a rising Africa, to an African renaissance, to celebrating the culture, the food, the fashion, and what we are all about on the continent, despite all the challenges that it must still, and we feel it must still claim, the 21st century as an African century. I'd like to thank our program director 
for managing this event as well as you did. And mind you, for keeping time, even when we started later than we had intended. We'd also like to thank you for engaging on the discussion, but you said you didn't want to be the professor. Professor Falula, I don't want to be you when people door stop you as you go out and saying you didn't see me, you know. The conversation about the African Union at 20 does not end tonight, but it starts here until the ideals of Africa's renaissance are achieved. We're going to make it happen, and we're going to make it happen intergenerationally. So you are welcome to join us for a modest dinner, and you'll be directed by our ushers. But before you join us for this modest dinner in the adjoining and adjacent room, I would like you to be so kind to um, allow the Chancellor, the Vice-Chancellor, and Professor Falula to leave first. But I'd ask the audience to rise as we do so, because you will also join in to go and join us at the dinner. Have a great night, and once again, happy Africa Month. Yeah.